Hello, and thanks for joining Real Story Group for today's webinar on how to select the right CDP technology. This is still a really hot topic uh, for us and for our customers, and we really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to join us. Um, my colleagues, uh, Apoor Durga and our founder, Tony Byrne, will be walking through the, the meat of today's presentation, but uh, I just wanted to kick things off. Uh, my name is Scott Dill. I'm on the business development team here with Real Story Group. And just to mention a couple of quick housekeeping items here as we get started, you can uh, ask questions in the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll have time to get to those uh, at the end of today's session. So any questions, feedback, anecdotes you wanna share, please feel free to add that into the uh, questions tab. We'll also uh, be sharing these slides with you uh, later this week. So uh, keep an eye out for that and then a recording will be available of this presentation within the next uh, week or two. I do see a lot of new names uh, on the list for today's webinar. So uh, thank you for, for taking a look at us for the first time. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with, with Real Story Group, uh, we'll just let you know that we're a different kind of analyst firm. Uh, we've been at this for over 22 years now. And when Tony started this company, it was more because what he was seeing out there uh, in the research reports at the time wasn't really aligning with his experience with the different technology products that are out there. And come to find out there's a little bit of a, a broken sort of quid pro quo model when it comes to some of the other firms that are out there. So and he started this company where we would never work for the vendors that we cover in any way. Uh, we wouldn't advise them on the strategy or write white papers for them. Our focus is on you uh, as a technology user and buyer to make sure you're getting the real story on what these vendors do well, but probably more importantly, what they don't do so well and where they might fall short for you. So today we're gonna to focus on the CDP technology marketplace uh, and the vendors within that space. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Tony and Apoor. Great, I'll jump in here first, Scott. So we're talking about customer data platforms. Always good to see technology in some broader context. So these are the 160 plus vendors that Real Story Group evaluates a uh, split into nine different marketplaces in this kind of subway or tube map that we've done for some time now. Each particular marketplace is a different line on this subway. So today we're talking about the orange line, customer data platforms. Really interesting space. I'm excited about it. We've been covering this technology now for about five years. So we've been watching these vendors very closely, learning uh, uh, from them, learning about them. Uh, mostly learning about you and, and your needs um, and just watching the marketplace evolve. So we'll be sharing some of that today. But of course, it's always important to take a look at customer data platform technology in particular in the context of your broader MarTech stack. So we'll be talking about that you know, a little bit as well. In terms of an agenda for today, uh, my colleague Apoorv will kick us off talking about some shifting architectures um, in, in how to think about CDPs in the context of a broader uh, customer data ecosystem and MarTech stack, really critical because there's substantial architectural differences among groups of CDPs here. Then I'll chat a little bit about the CDP marketplace before we get into the real meat of the session today, which is the right way to select a CDP. And then we'll wrap up with uh, a, a set of key takeaways that you can bring back to your enterprise. So Apoorv, tell us about, about shifting architectures. Thank you, Tony. Uh, hi, everyone. So let's first look at some of the architectural considerations and how things are evolving, uh, some of which are relevant to CDP selection. Right. So this slide, sorry, I have a power cut off, but I hope you can hear me OK. So this slide is really an expanded view of the traditional CDP model. You'll find out in a bit why I use the term traditional. Uh, essentially, what you do is that you ingest data from several zero, first, second, and third party data sources. Uh, some examples of these data sources are mentioned on the left side of this chart. right? And then you apply several data management aspects uh, or what we call customer data platform services to this ingested data. So you transform it you clean it, you normalize it, you create a customer 360 degree profile of your users. Now, once you have these clean profiles of your users, you then do what is commonly known as 
activation so you activate all of that data or profiles for your downstream marketing activities right so you for example you can segment that data you can do calculations such as uh, ltv or spends or other factors and then you activate these segments meaning you use it for personalization running campaigns doing advertising or uh, running analytics now early cdps wanted to do all of these activities and a lot of them claim to do most of these tasks mentioned in this middle box called customer data platform services but as the industry matured and uh, and tony next slide please but as the industry matured, you see, we are now seeing this new model emerging in which there are two distinct categories or sets of services and they are customer data processing, uh, this one in blue and customer data activation. So you see the middle box has been split into two boxes now, right? And they are essentially processing and activation. Now, a lot of organizations uh, have an existing data fabric or an existing data ecosystem of, uh, of say, a data warehouse, uh, a data lake, MDM, etc. And they are asking them, they are asking us, or they are ask, in general asking this question, uh, saying we are already doing many of these tasks elsewhere. So why do we need a CDP to do those again, right? So therefore, now you have these two boxes in the middle: a processing hub and an activation hub. So you think of these as separate set of uh, services or capabilities. You might still do them using a single CDP, but they are still logically and functionally separate. And we see several organizations relying on their existing data fabric or data environment for activities that are mentioned in this processing box or processing hub. In fact, we see several variations of this architecture. So CDP vendors understand that this is happening which is why many of them now partner with third party vendors for things like id resolution so anyways the the key point was that uh, there is an emerging model of cdp architecture that separates data processing from data activation more clearly than it did before uh, this slide uh, expands on that idea further uh, this is what we call as a service model for customer data right so you see these four stages here, they are roughly mapped to data lifecycle, right? Irrespective of the technology platform that you might be using, your customer data probably goes through all these four, all these four stages, right? So the first uh, box is uh, about uh, about ingesting data from various online and offline data sources uh, before you can actually do with it. So therefore, you need some sort of a mechanism for uh, for ingesting that data, performing transformations on it, uh, doing sort of aggregation, uh, modeling and that sort of thing. Once you have this data collected or ingested from different sources, you need to tie it to user profiles, right? So that includes activities such as profile unification, identity resolution. You enrich this data with, the, with data from other sources. Uh, so essentially you have enriched profiles with additional data. And at the same time, you want to be able to do data governance and compliance. Then you have the third uh, box in orange, which is the customer data activation box, right? So, so when once you have all these cleaned up, aggregated, unified profiles uh, or 360 degree views of uh, of your customers, you want to be able to do something with it, right? So that could be in terms of processing, creating cohorts, uh, doing sending real time emails or triggers. Uh, and that kind of stuff and finally you have the purple box which is essentially the last mile right so you engage with your customers via e-commerce email web mobile chat and other channels right you also do things like personalized content and product recommendations now in larger or complex enterprises the first two phases that are in in gray and blue are typically a part of a broader enterprise fabric or enterprise data environment. These kind of enterprises already possess data management tooling to handle those activities, right? So things like data, like I mentioned, data lakes, warehouse, ETL tools, ELD tools, reverse ETL tools, and other tools for quality and governance. 
and they use them on top of their enterprise data that includes customer data. So enterprise IT and data teams become really important stakeholders in the first two stages. In the later two stages though, you will see considerable higher involvement of marketing and customer experience teams. Now in theory, all these services can be potentially addressed by a CDP. Uh, in fact, you will often see CDP vendors boasting that they can perform all these stages. In real world though, we don't find that very often. In fact, rarely do large or complex enterprises deploy a single platform for all these stages. So for example, here you will see at the bottom of this slide, different scopes for company A, B and C, right? So if you are like, um, Company A, you probably are more interested in the first two boxes, whereas if you are a company C, your scope is more on the activation side, right? So it is then very important for you to be able to decide what a CDP will do for you before actually getting down to selecting a CDP. Uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, since we talked about data fabric, right and data environment the question about usage of data warehouse inevitably comes up right as you know data warehouses and data lakes when i use data warehouse here i i include both data warehouse data lakes uh, and and things like that right so these have become more prevalent in enterprise uh, martech stacks enterprise tech stacks enterprise cx stacks etc right now this of, of, of often begs this question should you employ your existing data warehouse as a customer data platform or CDP or not? You see the argument there is that uh, when you use an existing um, a component in your stack, you can save resources and avoid new risks, right? Of course, uh, in real life, the story isn't that simple. The real story isn't so simple as we like to say, right? And there are multiple uh, potential design patterns that can be used if you were to use a data warehouse as your CDP, right? So there are three patterns uh, drawn on this slide and we can't get into details of all three, but essentially they are, uh, the first one is connecting your marketing platform directly to a data warehouse. So there are some messaging platforms that can do that kind of stuff. Uh, the ex pattern on the right is essentially using reverse ETL tools to employ data warehouse and then pick and, and, and then exporting those segments to your marketing system. And then the third, uh, which is in the middle one is essentially about uh, data warehouse thing, data warehouse coexisting with your CDP. Now each pattern, each of these patterns have uh, their own trade-offs uh, that you need to keep in mind while evaluating your options. Now some of these trade-offs are mentioned here and, and they include things like real-time use cases, marketer usability and adjacent capabilities. But more importantly, even before you think of these considerations, you need to consider if a data warehouse is actually right fit for you in terms of governance and structural fit, resourcing, self-servicing, and, and those kind of things. So anyways, the key takeaway is that there is no right answer uh, as with other things, but there are multiple choices that you have, and you need to explore all of those choices uh, for your specific use cases. Your mute, Tony. It wouldn't be a, a web session without somebody uh, not unmuting. But thanks, Apoor. Um, that was a good tour. I didn't, we don't include data warehouse vendors as in our CDP list, but but they typically do play an important role in your sort of broader enterprise customer infrastructure. Uh, so we'll be talking briefly about the CDP marketplace now. Just wanted to remind you that if you had any questions or concerns, something you agree with, something you disagree with, um, a story you'd like to share, feel free to use the questions tab in your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll have about five minutes at the end to address it. So let's look at the marketplace. So the marketplace is, of course, a little bit messier than this, but analysts, we like to put things into boxes you know, on a two-dimensional screen. So that's what we've done here. And you'll see we've bisected uh, this, this list twice. So 
We'll start with the top row here, which are the independent vendors. And the independent vendors have really been driving this market for the, the, the five or six years, five or eight years that it's really uh, existed. And you'll see we have a line going north to south here in between the more processing-oriented independents and the activation and decisioning-oriented independents. So the idea here is to a poor's point about some are more enterprise and more data ops-oriented and some are more marketing and CX ops oriented. This is sort of your, your division here. Now there's also a, a horizontal row here where there's a second row, there's a horizontal line delimiting a second row at the bottom. And these are MarTech suite vendors. And so it's really interesting story here because all of these vendors at first avoided and in fact rejected the idea that a CDP had a rightful place in your stack. Then, of course, the world ended up proving them wrong and they quickly changed their minds in the last three or four years and have acquired or built or done both uh, with respect to a CDP. Consequently, we do categorize these separately because they tend to be more immature, they tend to be less feature rich. Uh, they're typically bought more than sold. In other words, when we see a competitive solicitation of the kind I'm gonna be recommending to you in the next couple minutes, then these vendors almost always lose. They typically just get bought because there's an existing relationship. And I would argue that's the wrong way to select technology. So what you're hearing from us is a big red flag uh, around these on the bottom row. We can of course talk more about that uh, in the Q&A period. So Apoor mentioned sort of architectural fit kind of north to south with respect to where the CDP fit into your, a, a kind of a layered stack of, of your customer data ecosystem. And that's reflected a little bit here in, in, in Real Story Group's reference model. Um, this is a reference model that we've spent a lot of time on. You can catch other webinars about it. I won't go into great details about this particular chart except to say that there are enterprise foundation services and then there are engagement services above that. The focus for the 2030s and the new omni-channel era is really gonna be around enterprise foundation services and that's why things like CDPs, which are nominally channel independent, uh, tend to be uh, 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 more of a foundational sort of enterprise capability. Now, this brings then to question, what's the scope of the CDP? And certainly customer data activation is, is core to, to 30 of the 31 CDPs that we evaluate. Um, but as a poor mentioned, some may or may not include customer data operations, some may or may not include customer data intelligence. And just to make things interesting, many CDPs do, um, do include decisioning capabilities, either testing, personalization, increasingly journey orchestration. Some also embed some outbound marketing capabilities. So you need to get clear about, you know, not just scope within the data management context, but also within the MarTech stack, which capabilities are you looking to be bundled in the CDP and which not. Uh, the purist in us has always said CDP should stick with data, but we have seen some of our subscribers be successful with using some of the decisioning services in CDPs. It seems like decisioning wants to be close to data. So uh, we're trying to keep an open mind about this, but you need to be very clear about what services render under a CDP and what services render under other capabilities within your broader stack. And again, if you're interested in this reference model, this is a B2C one, we also have B2B ones, uh, you can find recorded webinars on our site that tell you a little bit more about this. In the meantime, though, let's get into the, the, the reason why you came here, which is the right way to select customer data platforms. So my colleague Jared and I wrote a book about this called The Right Way to Select Technology. We wrote this about four years ago. It wasn't about CDP specifically, but we find that the that the overall methodology works very well with CDPs. And the methodology is really around design thinking. And we developed this as over really more than a decade as a kind of an antidote to waterfall style technology selections. So uh, this is a much more agile-ish approach that's business focused, team-based, empirical, iterative, and adaptive. Um, and so this is how you really get to the right fit. And by the way, this is also how you get to much faster implementations by going through this uh, as we describe the right way. So in the context of CDPs, we apply this same sort of model that this is the classic notions of design thinking, our empathy, definition, ideation, prototyping, and testing, right? So 
uh, for, the first thing you want to do is create diverse user stories. Um, and so we've created a lot of really interesting user stories around CDPs, including the CDP operators, marketers, um, of course, different types of customers, um, data analysts, marketing ops. You know, there's a lot of really important user stories that go into a CDP. And then, of course, some uh, uh, technical and systems questions to ask as well. Then you want to create an RFP and vendor shortlist. Uh, we have some strong ideas around this, um, around using scenario-based uh, 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 vetting of vendors and then getting to a shortlist that way. That's a big part of what we do at Real Story Group. Um, you review proposals and demos, perhaps from four of them. Sometimes we'll combine the green and the and the yellow phase there into an RFD. Then the, the thing that I really want you to remember out of this is this orange box, which is to have hands-on bake-offs. So now it's really interesting because uh, this is uh, something that we that we sort of uh, uh, elaborated doing these competitive bake-offs before the advent of CDPs. We weren't sure whether they would work really well for CDPs, but it turns out they work very, very well for CDPs. So if you get pushback from a vendor saying, no, they don't want to do, you can do a paid prototype, but we're not going to do a competitive bake-off, you definitely want to drop that vendor because we have seen these been extraordinarily useful, educational, but also help you decide which of the two finalists are the best fit for you. Now, the key distinction between a bake-off and a demo is a bake-off, you're actually hands-on. So what's interesting is CDPs, you can typically do a three to five day sprint with a CDP vendor. You need to do it once for one week with one vendor, once with another. And you really get a sense for what that CDP wants to do well and what it doesn't want to do well. Now, optionally, after you've gotten down to a single finalist, um, unfortunately, CDP contract negotiations tend to be very, very complicated. They can last anywhere from four to 12 weeks. During that period, you may want to do a more technical POC where you're doing some performance and integration testing, but you're only doing it with one vendor. So this process has worked very well for our subscribers. Um, in some cases, we've led them through this. In other cases, we've just given them templates for this, including like bake-off templates and things like that. And they have done it in more of a self-service way. The key thing is not to just, you know, look at a bunch of demos or say, all right, we're a big Salesforce shop, so we're going to use Salesforce CDP. You really want to put these vendors uh, through their pacing. And by the way, you'll negotiate a much better deal. I think by now you probably realize there's a lot of different things that a CDP could do for you. Um, the question is really what do you need it to do for you and what um, is what renders maybe under other parts of your stack. And this is interesting because you can see among these 10 different use cases that we have that potentially could get filled, fulfilled by a CDP. Typically a single vendor is only going to be good at three at best four of these and then maybe have a story around one or two others. So you really want to be able to match up, you know, the, the things that are real business drivers for you against what the vendor perceives or has really elaborated as their particular strengths um, in this market. And of course, this is what Real Story Group does in our own research, um, where we evaluate the vendors not on specific features, but how do they match up against specific use cases? So I'll give you an example of that. This is using Real Story Group's decision support tool, which is called Real Quadrant. So you remember that joke we made at the beginning about the miserable quadrant or whatever. This, the Real Quadrant, is actually a dynamic quadrant where you input a series of variables and then it spits out a custom quadrant for you. So in this case, if you look over at the left, we're looking at a more enterprisey CDP. So the three key scenarios that we're really trying to weigh in on are on the channel and offline aggregation, advanced customer data management, predictive analytics. This is a more of a data ops, data processing oriented use case. And you can see that there's a limited set of vendors over there in the two right quadrants that are going to be a good match. So I'll tell you a little bit about this quadrant here. Uh, the scenario fit is the x-axis, so in, to what extent is the vendor good at these three scenarios or, or has been successful at these three scenarios? And then in the y-axis is strategic consideration fit, which this is basically about the strength and health of the vendor itself and its broader ecosystem. So this is one, and you can see, now I'm not logged in here. If I was a Real Story Group subscriber, I could log in and you'd see the actual vendor name. So you have to be a subscriber to actually see the vendor names. But look over here, there's a set of vendors, vendor 2, 22, 23, 18, 30, 11, so on and so forth. But now if we take a very different 
set of user scenarios that I would describe as more marketing ops oriented. So we want to support outbound marketing, online personalization, digital advertising, kind of a classic marketing oriented CDP. It's a whole different set of vendors. There's literally no overlap between the vendors here that are in the top uh, right quadrant or, or, or the lower right quadrant. So the point here is that you don't want to follow these static quadrants that designate generic leaders and losers. What you really want is to understand what scenarios are important for you and then match those vendors against that. And of course, this is exactly what Real Story Group does. So you can certainly uh, uh, contact us and I'll, I'll give you some coordinates around that um, in a minute. So let's wrap up here. I see a lot of questions coming in. That's great. We're going to try to cover them all. Um, so, you know, this is just something you can print out later, put in your, uh, 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 put up on a bulletin board or something. But, you know, CDPs are increasingly foundational to an omni channel stack, but are not ends in and of themselves. So, you do need to look at your broader customer data strategy. Um, the vendors are beginning to sort themselves out into different categories, primarily around, again, heavy duty data processing versus more forward looking marketing ops. Um, you do need to then consider the proper scope of the CDP, both with respect to data services, but also other marketing services. Um, and then always, 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 number five, employ an agile-oriented selection process that features adaptive testing of these tools with your user stories, right? Not generic vendor user stories. So make it very empirical that way. The CDP marketplace is likely to remain fragmented for some time. Um, and so you um, really need to bring uh, your teams together um, to test these solutions out. And, and obviously we're here uh, to help you make good decisions all the way along. Uh, there's three different ways that Real Story Group can help you. The first is uh, you can just license our CDP research. In other words, take a ride on the orange line here. Um, and then that gives you access to the Real Quadrant Generator with all the vendor names. Um, you can get access to us and templates and, and, and we can help you vet your RFP, your shortlist, everything else. We're an advisor to help you be successful. Second option, which some large enterprises do with us, is to basically license all of our research. We call this a full stack subscription. You license all of our research and then we also advise you on the broader shape of your stack using our reference models. And then a subset of those join our exclusive um, executive uh, uh, MarTech Council, where marketing and technology leaders come together privately uh, without vendors, just with us, to share lessons, to describe what they're doing, um, to gossip about the vendors, but also to help each other out and um, uh, uh, share lessons learned in a very structured uh, way. We do this online and then we also do two-day meetings. Our next two-day meeting um, is actually going to be in Washington, D.C., in November, uh, our next offline, our next online Zoom meeting is going to be in late August, and we're going to be gathering uh, a, a whole set of AI and ML use cases. So really excited about uh, option three, the council there. So um, Scott can talk to you about how to get in touch. And in the meantime, we'll take a look at some of your questions here. Great. Thanks, Tony and Aporv. And as you can see here, you can take a look at our research, not just CDPs, but all the areas that we cover. You're welcome to download samples from all of that. And then, as Tony mentioned, we offer that, that Real Quadrant shortlist generator. And I'd be happy to walk you through a behind the scenes tour of that to give you a sense of, of how that works and how that could be applicable uh, to your organization's needs as you consider which CDP vendor is the right one for you moving forward. Um, our next webinar is going to be on July 12th. If you're thinking about DAM technology along with CDP technology, we're going to be looking at your journey to DAM 4.0. So uh, welcome to join us for that. Uh, in the meantime, Tony, it does look like a number of questions have come in today. Yeah, so I'll start with the first one. Hey, Alden, good to see you. Um, and Alden is asking, how common is it to feed a CDP with a real-time event bus such as Kafka? It's very, very common, Alden. Um, the interesting thing about that is that sometimes, you know, in terms of processing the various topics and things like that, there's a little bit of integration work that needs to happen there. I would say that about any CDP connector or ingest platform. The more interesting thing there, though, is what does the event subsystem look like in the CDP? In other words, what does the CDP actually do with that? Some of them don't really have an eventing subsystem. They may have different triggers based on, on attribute value changes. Um, some of them 
do not have a real-time function at all. So um, they're 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 just sort of listening and doing micro batches. So the question is. It's certainly an excellent way to stream data into a CDP. The question is, does the CDP then pick that up with the same degree of, of urgency or processing that may or may not be implied or needed there? Donald is asking, I'm gonna throw this one to you, Apoorv. Um, Donald is asking, have you taken a look at the Salesforce product changes from, there are two CDPs actually that they had now to the so-called data cloud. So Apoorv, um, we certainly have been tracking this. You want to just give an overview on that? Yeah, yeah. Be be before doing that, Tony, I just wanted to add on about Kafka. In fact, some CDPs actually use Kafka as their as their default connector for doing real-time event streaming. So, for example, Segment uses Kafka. There are other CDPs that did use Kafka as well. Now, about this question, yeah, we have been following uh, Salesforce for a while. In fact, when Bob Schultz, their CEO, called it a passing fad, right? We have been tracking them since then, right? And then they acquired Evergage, which was their CDP, and then they came up with their own CDP. Then they came up with Salesforce Genie, which they have now renamed to Data Cloud, right? So, so we have, we have followed followed them uh, quite a bit. Uh, the newest version of Salesforce uh, CDP, which is which is supposedly their long-term CDP now, uh, essentially data cloud, uh, packages a lot of uh, additional things on top of their uh, erstwhile CDP, right? So it has some uh, newer real-time capabilities. It also build, it, it also packages things like uh, journeys and insights uh, in addition to what was already there in the CDP. Plus it also gets data from other Salesforce uh, cloud. So it gets data from W, it gets, data from Salesforce sales clouds and so on. So we can summarize that data cloud, like a lot of Salesforce stuff is basically throwing a lot of things into one into one basket and hoping that you'll buy it all, um, among other things. Marianne is asking a good question. Can you talk to the evaluation processes that are led by marketing ops versus those led by IT or data? So Marianne, if this is going to be a business platform, ideally business is the chair of the selection and IT and data are first class participants at the table. Um, I would say that's the case maybe 95% of the time in, in, um, in CDP selections, both in our book and in our advisory services, we talk about building the right CDP selection team and it's typically an interdisciplinary interdepartmental team, ideally chaired by a business person. The one exception, and I would say this is the case maybe in five to 10% of the time when the CDP is exclusively a data ops platform. In other words, there's, not, there's no anticipation that business users will be in the platform at all. It's gonna be just exporting data to more business run platforms. And in that case, it's really a data ops purchase and should be managed by data ops and, and, and IT. John is asking, how do you discern the difference between an activation oriented versus a decision oriented CDP? How different are they really and do I evaluate or uncover these differences? That's a good question, John, because we did create those boxes and we thought a little bit about that because the differences are actually a little bit more subtle than some of the other differences between the boxes and I think you've picked up on that. At some level, John, they're really both activation oriented. It's just that the ones on the, on the right hand side of the box, the more decisioning oriented ones, are beginning to wander into different decisioning services, um, some wandering more seriously than others. So that might include um, testing and optimization, it might include journey orchestration, it might include personalization, it might include some stab at all three. So yes, they're activation oriented and not processing oriented, but they're also kind of leaning into certain types of decisioning services that you may or may not want bundled with your CDP. And that's the real difference between those two. Great, so those are some fabulous questions. We went five minutes over. Wanted to thank you all again for participating. Um, you'll hear next from Scott about getting a copy of the deck and those of you who are subscribers can log in anytime uh, after about the next 24 hours or so to see a full recording and share that with others within your enterprise. Um, so in the meantime, uh, this is uh, Tony Byrne from Real Story Group. Uh, signing off on behalf of my colleagues, Scott Dill and Apoor Durga. See you next time. Bye now.